begin. So good morning. I'm Robin Mukherjee, a student in the School of Philosophy and Economic Science. It's the summer of 1802, an early morning in London. Very early, in fact, the city hasn't quite woken up yet. Two people, Dorothy Wordsworth and her brother William, are standing on Westminster Bridge. They're on their way to France, having traveled down from their home in the Lake District. For William, this is a pivotal moment in his life when he has to face his past and the consequences of his actions. He hopes to resolve what might be called the unresolvable, to face whatever pain he has to face and to move on. It's also a pivotal period in the history of ideas, the movements of thought through art, literature and politics. So let's just draw the lens back a little and take a look at the life and times of the young poet William Wordsworth, and after a brief sojourn through this era of enormous change, personally and globally, we'll come back to him with his sister on the bridge. As I'm sure everyone here knows, William Wordsworth was born in the Lake District, and as we've seen, returned to it from time to time after journeys abroad to London and around the country. I'm told that if you open the window of the little room in the little cottage in which he spent his infant years, you are immediately immersed in the sound of the river, the Derwent, rushing, gurgling, murmuring, and all the various myriad sounds that a river makes. And this is what William spent those early days of his life listening to. It's a sound that never really left him. Wordsworth's group of writers, the Lake Poets or the Romantics, are sometimes, I think, mischaracterized as privileged young men bathed in self-pity or, or self-importance rhapsodizing in their many idle hours about flowers, clouds, the landscape. And it's quite wrong. William was orphaned early and sent to live with relatives separated from his beloved sister for years. And he didn't know wealth. He didn't know much beyond penury until much later in his life. And though he's sometimes thought of as a pastoral poet, and he did write about nature, his focus was on the human experience of nature as Barbara Hepworth discussed. The moment you put a figure in the landscape, a person, a human being, any sentient creature, a landscape becomes a shape, an abstract, an emotion. This might be a good moment just to take a look at the other landscape, if you will, the cultural landscape of the times. I don't want to get too complex, but here we go. The prevailing ideology had been for some time what we call the Enlightenment the upending of despots, superstition, and received wisdom in favor of rationality, materialism, empiricism, science. We owe a great deal to the work of the great philosophers of the Enlightenment, Newton, Locke, Diderot, Kant, and many others. And it was Kant who said that it was time to cast off man's immaturity through the action of the inquiring mind, to which he added a little contentiously, even if the limits of possible knowledge are revealed in the process. And therein lies the rub. There is a distinction between that which can be measured, defined and understood, and that which belongs to the realm, if you like, of the heart. Diderot himself, the great collector of knowledge, said that, quote, it is only the passions and the great passions that can raise the soul to great things. Jane Austen wrote of this dichotomy as sense and sensibility, the mundane, if you like, and the sublime. For Wordsworth and Coleridge and their poetic fellow conspirators, the sublime was of importance, paramount importance. It lies, wrote Wordsworth, hidden from the reach of words. Hidden from the reach of words. But he says, there's not a man that lives who hath not known his godlike hours. It's something we can all recognize. Many of Wordsworth's most celebrated poems describe these moments, the godlike hours, however fleeting, when the individual is taken out of the tumult into a realm of greater steadiness, often standing alone, a solitary figure, musing, feeling, sensing, writing. This is iconic romanticism. It's Rousseau walking the Alps, recording the potency of nature and the mystery of being. In the prelude, Wordsworth describes a boy among the hills of Cumbria. This is just an instance. 
calling to the owls, cupping his hands and waiting for a response. And he writes, then sometimes in that silence, while he hung listening, a gentle shock of mild surprise has carried far into his heart the voice of mountain torrents or the visible scene would enter unawares into his mind with all its solemn imagery, its rocks, its woods, and that uncertain heaven received into the bosom of the steady lake. I love that, that uncertain heaven received into the bosom of the steady lake. And we might recognize these themes of his of silence and stillness and <clears throat> steadiness and its effect, what he calls far into the heart. He gave a name to these moments. Let me just take that down. When he wrote, quote, there are in our existence spots of time that with distinct preeminence retain a renovating virtue. What he calls spots of time, Virginia Woolf called moments of being. It's neither a rare concept in literature nor an obscure one to philosophers. And there are many, many instances in his writing which were in their time, poetically and culturally, of course, significant. I would even say revolutionary. He took the epic form and wrote of simple moments, a day in the life of a child calling to the owls. And when he was asked, why doesn't he write about great things? He said, these are the great things. In 1802, he spent the spring and early summer back in his beloved Grassmere. It was a wonderful, poetically prolific time. Coleridge and friends. Dorothy catches a moment of it in her journal. Yes, it being a beautiful morning, we set off at 11 o'clock, intending to stay out of doors all the morning. Coleridge and I pushed on before. We left William sitting on the stones, feasting with silence. And she anticipates the arrival of Mary, a friend of Dorothy and dear friend of William, who he intends to marry. So this is a wonderful moment in their lives. William, his sister, his friends, his writings, his future wife, and the tranquility of the lakes. Just a few months later, William and Dorothy are standing on Westminster Bridge, staring out to the Thames and the city beyond, early in the morning on their way to France. William had been to France before, as we've said, as a young man when he fell in love with a lady called Annette and fathered a child with her. He'd seen the revolution and welcomed it, writing famously, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive and to be young was very heaven. He watched it turn sour. He walked over bloodstains on the pavements and saw a friend executed under the guillotine. After he returned to England, Britain and France went to war and the borders were closed. At this point then, on the bridge in the summer of 1802, he'd never even met his daughter, Caroline, who was now nine years old. Later, he provided for them for, for the rest of his life. But at this moment, he was going back in a brief suspension of hostilities between Britain and France to tell Annette that he intended to marry his childhood sweetheart, Mary. So this was by any account a heavy hour. And he wrote a poem. I'll read it, I won't analyze it, but I will say that one of the reasons I chose it was simply to consider the idea that these spots of time, these godlike hours, aren't in the end dependent on the scenery, the circumstances, or any sort of rustic idyll, though certainly they may be provoked by beauty. Given the circumstances, he could have written The Wasteland, but he wrote this. Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. This city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning, silent, bare. Ships, towers, domes, theatres, and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did the sun more beautifully steep in his first splendour, valley, rock, or hill. 
ne'er saw I, never felt a calm so deep. The river glideth at his own sweet will, dear God, the very houses seem asleep, and all that mighty heart is lying still. Thank you for your company this morning. It's the last Philosophy Live this term. We resume on the 19th of January. And if you're not already engaged with a philosophy or economics class and would like to join one, then introductory terms begin around the country and online in January. Just take a look at the website. Have a very, very good Christmas, and I'll see you sometime in the new year. I was just hang around for the chat, but this will be edited out of the broadcast. But Nicholas Diderot um, was the great right, master of the encyclopedia, the Encyclopédie, which was the collation of all the knowledge in the world, a great enlightenment project, an extraordinary project. So he was the mastermind of gathering knowledge. But I love the fact that he said, you know, there is this other element to the human being. It's not just, as it were, material knowledge, cerebral knowledge, logical knowledge. There's there's that which is accessed through what he calls the passions, but we might call you know, the spirit. Um, so that, that, I mean, I presented enlightenment and romanticism as a dichotomy. You know, it's a little more complex than that, but there are elements where you could say, you know, they were a conversation with each other and romanticism expanded or was the child of enlightenment but really quite different but i'll leave it there have a good day have a lovely christmas as i said and uh, yeah happy new year when it comes <laughs>